Remember, in the previous section, we wanted to approximate the area under the curve of a function. And the way we approached this was by imparting some rectangles over small intervals to use to estimate. We used both a left and right hand estimate to try to gauge what the area under the curve would be. We want to be able to take this idea and we want to generalize it. Remember that when we did this, we had determined that when delta t gets smaller, n gets bigger, and when that happens, our estimate gets better. So how can we talk about the area under a curve for a generic function and then talk about how to come up with the best estimate we can? Let's take a look at the important pieces and see how this might work. Remember that we determined that we could find delta t, or our time interval, by looking at b minus a, which were our endpoints, divided by n, the number of rectangles that we wanted to use for our approximation. In order to set up a general approximation for area under the curve for a left-hand approximation, we are gonna need to index our general picture. So we're gonna start with the picture on the left. What I want you to notice is that we're calling this function f of t. This could represent any function we wanted to. In this case, we have a decreasing function. It doesn't have to be that way. We're gonna generalize how we represent the area of each of these rectangles, and we'll be able to apply it to any function, remembering that with a left-hand approximation, the leftmost point of each rectangle will touch your function. So we're starting at point A, and we're going all the way until point B. You can see that in this picture, there is a literal four rectangles. However, we're trying to generalize this so we can put in as many rectangles as we want. However, we're still only looking between A and B. So if we were to cut our delta T in half, we could fit eight rectangles in the same length. We need a way to index our points since we're doing this generically. So we're gonna index them by using subscripts. So our A, or our starting point, we're gonna call T sub zero. The next point we'll call T sub one, the next point T sub two, dot, dot, dot. And then the last point we're gonna call T sub n. We're using the dot, dot, dot to recognize the fact that when we do this generically, we wanna be able to put in as many rectangles as we want. Here, T sub n would be T sub four. But again, if we wanted to put in eight rectangles, then we would have T sub eight, 16 rectangles would be T sub 16, so on and so forth. So let's examine the area of one rectangle. So let's start with the first one. Remember, the width of every rectangle is delta T. So to get the area, we need to do width times height. So for the first rectangle, the height of this rectangle will be F of T sub zero. So there's two points that define this rectangle, T sub zero and T sub one, the left point and the right point. Since we're talking about a left-hand estimation, it's the leftmost point that's gonna determine the height. And to get the height or the Y value, we'd have to plug T sub zero into our function. But remember, our function is the generic F of T. So the height is F of T sub zero. So that means the area of this rectangle is delta T times f of t sub zero. Similarly, the second one will be delta t times f of t sub one. The third one will be delta t, f of t sub two, dot, dot, dot. And then the last one, we know the rightmost point is t sub n. The point before that, which is the leftmost point of our last rectangle, is t sub n minus one. Again, we're keeping it vague so that if we want to put in more rectangles, we've accounted for that. So that means if we want to get the area under the curve for a left-hand approximation, we need to add up all of these terms. So here we see left-hand sum, which is delta t, f of t sub zero. We multiply the width times the height plus delta t times f of t sub one plus dot, dot, dot. And then the last one is delta t times f of t sub n minus one. The plus dot 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 
tells us that we're going to include all the terms in between 1 and n minus 1 as a subscript of t. So again, that allows us to account for however many rectangles we plan to put in. We can do a similar analysis with a right-hand approximation. So with the right-hand sum, we'll look over here, we want the rightmost point of every rectangle to touch our function. Again, we're using the generic function f of t, and we're using the same index as before. So that means that the area of the very first rectangle here is delta t, that's our width, but now the height is gonna be based on the rightmost point of our rectangle, or t sub one. So it's the t sub one that we're gonna plug into our f of t to get the height or the y value of our rectangle. So we're gonna multiply delta t times f of t sub one, then the next one will be delta t times f of t sub two, and then our last one will jump to delta t times, now here, we're using the rightmost point, so f of t sub n. So again, we need to add up all of our areas, which we can do by writing delta t f of t sub one plus delta t f of t sub two plus dot 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 delta t f of t sub n. So we have a way to write these terms in a generic way. The difference between the two is where our subscript starts and ends. So for a left-hand sum, we're starting at t sub zero, because we're using the leftmost point, whereas with the right-hand sum, we start at f of t sub one in our term, because we don't use the leftmost point. Similarly, on the other end, our left-hand sum ends with f of t sub n minus one in the term, because we don't use the rightmost point, whereas our right-hand sum ends with f of t sub n, because it does use the rightmost point. Okay, so now imagine that you wanna fit a thousand rectangles in that interval a to b. That's a lot of rectangles. You do not wanna write out a thousand terms. That would be incredibly long and incredibly frustrating. So we need to come up with some alternative notation to represent when we have lots and lots and lots of these terms. So there's a notation in mathematics that's called summation notation. And that's what we're gonna use here to sum up these things in a more concise way. So now we're gonna write our terms that are all added up with summation notation. So with summation notation, we have this funny looking stretched out E, which is the summation notation. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write all the terms that are the same in all of these so every single one of these terms for a left-hand sum has a delta t. Every single one of the terms has an f, all of them have a t. What's changing is the subscript. So with our summation notation, we notate whatever is being indexed or changed by i. So that means that's what's gonna be changed from term to term, and then we have to define where i lives on the summation notation. So here, i goes from zero to n minus one. So what that means is you start with zero, f of t sub zero, plus delta t, f of t sub one, plus, and you keep going until you get to delta t, f of t sub n minus one. So if we had a thousand rectangles in there, we could concisely represent that using this summation notation. And we can do the same thing with the right-hand sum. And the major difference between the two is our index. So the left-hand sum starts at zero and goes to n minus one, and the right-hand sum goes from one to n. So this summation notation has a special name. It's called a Riemann sum. So when you're summing up the rectangles, in order to find the area under the curve, it's called a Riemann sum. So we have the left-hand Riemann sum and we have the right-hand Riemann sum. And again, the difference is in the index. So this is the nice way we can write this in general to talk about how we represent the area under the curve.